Welcome to Islamophobia in this France, is being recorded. 2022 presidential elections and the criminalization of Muslim civil society. Um, I'm John Esposito, director of the Al-Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and of its Bridge Initiative. I, with my colleagues in ACMCU, had been tracking and writing about Islamophobia since the late 1990s. However, in 2014, in response to the exponential growth of Islamophobia, the center launched the Bridge Initiative, protecting pluralism, ending Islamophobia. Bridge is a multi-year research project originally created to study Islamophobia in the US and in Europe. We have broadened our monitoring, research, and writing to include global Islamophobia as seen in the genocide of the Rohingya in Myanmar and the Uyghurs in China and the plight of Muslims in India, among others. Today, we look at the extent to which, as in American presidential elections, Islamophobia has grown during the presidency of President Emmanuel Macron and become a running theme in France's upcoming presidential elections. I will now turn the program over to Mubashra Tazamal, senior bridge researcher, organizer, and moderator of today's program. Thank you so much, Dr. Esposito. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for what is certainly going to be a very insightful and important conversation regarding Islamophobia in France. And firstly, I do want to say Ramadan Mubarak to all those observing. And I'm going to apologize for any mistakes I make in pronouncing French words. My French is not that great. Um, so today's topic, um, anti-Muslim racism has steadily increased in the last two decades in France. Um, this is from discriminatory hijab bans to racist rhetoric from politicians, all of which has resulted in the collective suspicion, stigmatization, and often criminalization of France's Muslim citizenry. France has the largest Muslim population in Europe, an estimated 6 million Muslims call the country home. And over the last two decades, the country has also been the target of a number of violent and deadly attacks. Often, in response to these attacks, the French government has responded with harsh and discriminatory measures targeting the entire Muslim community, simply because they share the same faith as the perpetrators of the attacks. In other words, the French government has consistently weaponized these violent attacks to institute unjust measures against millions of Muslims. Another element of what's been occurring in the country has been the consistent utilization of laicite or secularism to justify the government's targeting of Muslim religious practice. This is per perfectly demonstrated in the authorities' campaigns against Muslim women who wear the hijab or niqab, arguing that donning a scarf or a veil is against the principles of laicite. And often these conversations around laicite involve discussion about French identity and what it means to be French. And from the rhetoric that, that's been coming out from some of the presidential contenders like Eric Zemmour and Marine Le Pen, they argue that one cannot be both French and Muslim. And such language and framing has meant that public discourse in the country fails to include nearly 6 million citizens and instead constructs them as suspicious, violent, disloyal, and foreign. As one of our panelists recently wrote, Dr. Gabon, he recently wrote, Islam and Muslims have come to be viewed as an existential threat to French civilization, traditions, and values. And some of the rhetoric and measures and policies that we've seen in the past two decades include hijab bans, niqab bans, burkini bans, the anti-separatism law, targeting of halal meat, attempts to ban female Muslim athletes who wear the hijab in sporting competitions, and overall consistently framing Islam and Muslims as a threat to France. We are just days away from the French first round of the French presidential elections as citizens will head to the polls starting April 10th. And some of the leading contenders include President Emmanuel Macron, center-right Valérie Pécresse, left-winger Jean-Luc Mélenchon, and two right-wing candidates, Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour. And all have incorporated and instrumentalized anti-Muslim bigotry in their campaigns, demonstrating the mainstreaming and normalization of Islamophobia across the political spectrum in France. And we've observed and research has shown that in numerous countries around the globe, Islamophobia is an electorally lucrative strategy. So it's not surprising that these candidates are employing it. However, the normalization of far-right theories, such as the Great Replacement 
and numerous legislation and policies that directly target and impact French Muslims' basic human rights signals that this is far greater than simply an election tactic. It's having deeply harmful, negative, and violent effects for millions of people in the country. And it's also pushing the country rightwards as racist and far-right views are normalized within the public. Today, we're going to talk with our panel of experts on the upcoming presidential elections, the normalization of Islamophobia in France, and what all of this means for French Muslims. So we'll have about a 45 minute uh, moderated discussion between myself and the panelists, and then we'll open up the last 15 minutes to an audience Q&A. So be sure to put your questions in the Q&A function. Um, now I'm going to introduce our wonderful panelists. Um, we have Reem Sara Alouan, who is a French legal scholar as a PhD candidate in comparative law at the University of Toulouse Capitole in France. Her research focuses on religious freedom, civil liberties, constitutional law, and human rights in Europe and North America. Ms. Alouan frequently appears on TV and radio in America and worldwide, including NPR, Al Jazeera, BBC, and France 24, where she discusses discrimination, human rights, violations, and politics. Then we have Marwan Mohammed, who is a French Egyptian author and statistician. After a career in finance, he dedicated the last 12 years to the fight against Islamophobia. He was a spokesman and then the director of the Collective Against Islamophobia in France, the most prominent human rights NGO in France supporting Muslims before becoming a diplomat for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, where he supported Muslim communities all across Europe, Central Asia, and North America. In 2018, he conducted the first survey of Muslims in France before founding Muslims Platform, an umbrella organization gathering hundreds of mosques and Islamic organizations across France with more than 75,000 supporters. He now works as a human rights consultant for an international organization. And last but not least, we have Dr. Alain Gabon, who is an associate professor of French studies at Virginia Wesleyan University in Virginia Beach. He has written and lectured widely in the US, Europe, and beyond on contemporary French culture, politics, literature, and the arts, and more recently on geopolitics, Islam, and Muslims in France and Europe. His work has appeared in academic journals, think tanks, and mainstream, and specialized, mainstream and specialized media, such as Sapphire News, Milestones, Commentaries on the Islamic World, Middle East Die, and La Calle de Islam. So now I'm going to move on to our um, moderated discussion. My first question is for you, Dr. Gabon. You and uh, our director, Dr. Esposito, recently signed an open letter along with dozens of international academics addressed to President Macron. And the letter states, under your leadership, France has turned into an increasingly Islamophobic and dangerously repressive society. You have no right to position yourself as more enlightened and more tolerant of Islam than Eric Zemmour or Marine Le Pen, or to claim to be the alternative to far-right bigotry. You have become one of them by contributing to the mainstreaming of right-wing discourse and Islamophobic policies. What have the past five years been like for French Muslims under Emmanuel Macron? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, it's, it's a difficult um, question to respond in five minutes, <laughs> it could take hours. Uh, and the second uh, thing is that I'm not gonna talk on behalf of Muslims. Uh, that would be incredibly presumptuous and arrogant uh, to try to do so. As a non-Muslim myself, uh, I'm gonna talk about Muslims, but not on behalf of them, uh, with the understanding that even though it might sound surprising to us, there are actually quite a few French Muslims who are supportive of Macron, including supportive of policies that we ourselves, I'm sure all of us here, consider Islamophobic. Uh, for example, the uh, good Muslims of the Republic, as I call them, those that you see on TV permanently 24 seven that are selected by our powers that be to incarnate uh, the perfect role models of Muslims that other Muslims are supposed to emulate. So they're, they're ideal. We know who they are. There is no need to give names, but uh, okay, well, I'm going to give like a few, like Imam Shalgumi, for example, that would be the caricatural version of that. And the more um, educated, sophisticated intellectual version would be somebody like uh, uh, Khaled Ben Sheikh, uh, uh, Akim El Karawi. Uh, so their ideological function, once they have been selected by the media and the political powers that be, 
uh, is to kind of domesticate the other Muslims by representing the kind of Muslims that we, France, are willing to uh, allow to exist on French soil. Uh, and anybody else who doesn't conform to this very type of specific Muslim role models, uh, usually quietist, obedient, uh, passive, uh, always even submissive in front of government, never critical of governmental policies. Anyone who doesn't enter that mold is labeled Islamist and, and targeted for elimination. Uh, that, so there is this good Muslim versus bad Muslim discourse, uh, pitting one against another, brother against brother, that has become like systematic on the French scene. And anyone who knows the French debate uh, can see that every day at work. Uh, however, uh, there are also ordinary Muslims who consider, for example, that uh, uh, Islam has become too politicized, uh, just like you have a lot of Christians in the US who consider that Christianity too has become too politicized, uh, that Islamism or what Macron calls Islamism has hurt their religion, degraded their faith, uh, prevented their integration. Uh, and those are actually um, uh, quite a few and they're willing to uh, accept uh, policies that the rest of us consider Islamophobic. Okay, so that was just like to mitigate, to nuance a little bit what, uh, what we're gonna say. But to answer the question, yes, I think that uh, five years after of Macron, Muslims and Islam as a religion is uh, worse off than it was before Macron which was not supposed to happen because Macron was elected on the, on the platform of uh, creating a, a liberal, open, all-inclusive, tolerant, enlightened society. And what we've seen happening is exactly the opposite, and not just for Muslims, but for everybody. Uh, uh, he's been um, authoritarian, he's been very autocratic. Uh, it's very easy to demonstrate that objectively. Uh, uh, I personally think he has turned France into a one-man state, <laughs> into a one-man rule. Um, so it's the situation of everybody who's worse off in terms of civil liberties and not just Muslims. Um, but to sum it up, uh, regarding Muslims uh, in particular, he has perfected, on the one hand, he has perfected all the logics, all the tools, all the instruments of state Islamophobia that already existed before him. He has taken them to a whole new level. He has expanded them on the one hand. And on the other hand, he has created new ones that he has started to launch against Muslims in particular, uh, but also against the rest of uh, the civil society. Uh, I can single out two methods, uh, particularly nasty and yet brutally effective methods that he has been using, he and his uh, interior minister, Gerald Darmanin. They function very much like a you know, Batman and Robin uh, dynamic duo, uh, Darmanin being probably the worst in my mind. Um, but increasingly, they are using uh, collective punishments of Muslims. Uh, and guilt by association. So collective punishment, for example, uh, closing a mosque of 1,500 Muslims on the basis that one of, it, of their members, one imam, has posted somewhere in the past a post uh, or made a declaration that Darmanin considers heinous and an incitement to hatred. Um, and there are articles specifically in the anti-separatism bill about that saying uh, uh, that the guilt uh, of one member of an Islamic or other body or an association, religious or non-religious association, can be extended to the totality of the institution. So that's the definition of uh, guilt of uh, collective punishment. Uh, and there are examples of that in which they have already started to apply this principle of collective punishment in a very systematic way. Uh, one imam posting a comment on Facebook, the comment was not removed fast enough. Uh, and then uh, they just shut down the mosque, the sports club, the association, the, uh, on, on the, using that as, as a ground. Uh, and the second method that they are using a lot is um, um, guilt by association. I call that the six degrees of association. So it, it functions something like that. So even if you yourself 
are not guilty of committing any crime, have not done anything wrong. You have been in contact in the past with someone who himself had been in contact with someone who had been in contact with someone who was in contact with a group out of which one member left for Syria in 2015. And that shows that you are a part of that mouvance jihadist, as they put it, of that uh, jihadist movement, uh, very vaguely defined. So if you combine those two, I think, new methods of uh, guilt by association, by several degrees of association, uh, and uh, collective punishment, it has the potential to create a lot of damage uh, to a lot of people. Uh, and most of those people would be perfectly innocent of any crime or any act of violence, and yet they find themselves in the crosshairs of the government. Uh, and to make that more concrete, if I can just like take one more minute, uh, there are three broad trends that have happened under the Macron uh, administration. Uh, and I'm just gonna cite them and then I can elaborate, give examples uh, later. The first one is an aggravation an expansion of what Jocelyne Cesari calls the securitization of Islam. I assume everybody knows what that refers to, but the securitization of Islam, uh, approaching Islam, considering Islam and Muslims as a potential threat that need to be controlled, reshaped, um, disciplined uh, from above in an authoritarian manner from the top down by the state itself. That logic of securi securitization has really creeped in French society a lot more than it used to uh, before Macron. That's the first logic, an expansion of securitization. Uh, the second logic is uh, uh, related to the first, uh, if you want to describe how securitization uh, occurred and the Macron, it's a kind of double logic, double dynamic of, on the one hand, horizontal expansion, and on the other hand, vertical penetration of state Islamophobia. So horizontal expansion, uh, meaning more and more groups are being targeted as enemies of the state uh, by the governments as a toxic, as existential threats, uh, and they are being targeted for suppression, censorship, eradication, elimination in a very uh, open and explicit manner. Um, and here we're talking about people who are not criminals, who are not terrorists, who uh, 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 have not been associated with uh, jihadists or terrorists and have absolutely no intention of committing any crime or any act of violence. So there's been a substantial modification in the nature of what used to be the war on terror. Uh, the war on terror and the Macron is being redefined as a war on political Islam, as a war on Islamism. Uh, so a lot sorry, of- Dr. Sorry, Dr. Govon, can, can I uh, interrupt? And I, we're gonna, I'm sure we're, a lot of my questions actually touch on this. So we have a very few minutes left, so. Um, 50 seconds, the third logic in one word, that's the criminalization of thought, dissent, criticism, and religious belief. That's it, that's the third trend. Thank you, sorry. No, no problem. Um, you mentioned about the criminalization of Muslims, and um, we've seen uh, a lot of this come out with using terminology such as uh, referring to Muslims as Islamists or using terms like Islamo leftists. Um, Marwan, can you talk about how the government has used terms such as Islamists to clamp down on mosques and mos Muslim civil society organizations? Yes, well, basically, they, uh, over the time, they recoded uh, the, the, the language, and it's not a new trend uh, in history. Whenever you want to normalize the stigmatization of a specific ethnic or religious uh, or cultural group, you can recode the language to normalize the hate that is behind this language. So basically, the far right started with this in the 80s with Marine Le Pen's uh, father, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, where they recoded, instead of their saying like, you dirty Arab, go back to your country. Over the time, they would say, we need to reclaim laicite uh, in, a firm, uh, in a firm way. And so the concept of Islamism and Islamo-leftism too have been recorded. And basically uh, any Muslim that disagrees with the far-right agenda is going to be labeled an Islamist. 
former prime uh, former minister of interior uh, uh, was uh, was uh, in power in 2018 19 he claimed that basically attending the mosque more often during ramadan or growing a beard or having a more firm religious practice in and of itself was a sign of islamism and should trigger an investigation and should trigger a reporting to the local authorities so that they get more information on the on the on the person so this framework uh, for constructing a muslim problem is basically so loose so wide that you can label any dissenting muslim as an islamist a few examples there was a, a singer her name was manel and she took part in a singing competition like the voice or something like that she was labeled the forefront of political islam trying to infiltrate french culture to seclude, to seclude the population and islamize the singing uh, just because she was wearing a headscarf or even a turban uh, in uh, academic uh, working on Islamic studies, if he or she is Muslim himself or herself, they will claim that basically they are infiltrating academia. So, so much so that last year, uh, Minister of Higher Education even wanted to conduct a formal investigation into Islamo leftism and Islamism at the university. This tells you, like, to the extent to which the government is willing to go not to ridicule themselves that they, they already achieved that, but really to uh, uh, antagonize the society in every way possible. And it produces the kind of effect uh, that uh, Dr. Gabon has uh, described earlier that Rimsara have been working on and studying over the past, uh, the past few years, which is basically to not make sense anymore, destroy the meaning of things destroy the meaning of academic concepts, uh, destroy any sense of understanding and rationality in public debate, and basically just demonizing individuals, stigmatizing them, just to give and bring political power to the current government. And the reason why uh, international opinion and international observers and commentators uh, uh, took a lot of time to take notice of what was going on, is that basically when Emmanuel Macron uh, attained power, when he reached power, when he uh, came into office, the comparison element, the comparison uh, 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 model was Donald Trump. So in comparison with Donald Trump, Macron was posing as this like progressive, young, innovative, uh, open, uh, open-minded, plus he spoke English, which was new for a French president, so much so that there was kind of a honeymoon between the international press and, uh, and Emmanuel Macron. And only a few observers, uh, like astute observers of the French scene, saw what was uh, coming. I would take examples. Uh, Professor Exposito saw it coming. Uh, Farid Hafez, who at the time was like already producing an annual report on, Isl on Islamophobia in, uh, in Europe, also saw this, uh, this trend. And when Macron came into power, his use and weaponizations of this concept was in the continuity uh, of the French post-colonial uh, uh, paradigm, if you, uh, if, uh, if I could say so, and was nothing new uh, in that way. But it took a, it took a while for uh, the Washington Post, uh, for the New York Times, for other academics, for other media outlets to say, hey, maybe what is going on in France is not so uh, uh, romantic and not so uh, idealized. And maybe we should uh, look further, look closer at what's, uh, what's going on. We should pay attention. That's how this concept became weaponized in the public discourse in France. Um, and another concept that's often referred to is, is laicite. And Reem Sara, you've written numerous pieces on laicite and what it means. You've testified before the US uh, Commission on International Religious Freedom for a hearing on anti-Muslim policies in Europe. Um, and you said the weaponization of laicite has allowed in public discourse to constantly question Muslim loyalty to France and debate whether or not Muslims can be good French citizens. Um, can you briefly explain laicite and how the interpretation of the term has changed over time and how under Macron's government, he's used it to justify Islamophobic policies? It's going to be really hard to, uh, like in a couple of minutes, to explain laicite. But first of all, I will uh, tell our audience that I'm not going to translate uh, laicite with secularism because I think it's not correct. So, uh, you know, if uh, indeed uh, 
lake countries are secular or secular countries are not necessarily lake. So uh, what is laicity? I hear a lot of things and uh, usually um, a lot of um, not really correct things. Uh, you have to go back to history a little bit to understand this uh, very uh, difficult concept to get. Even in France, we have a hard time with it. So um, it's a concept that has been inspired by uh, the revolution. As uh, you probably know, uh, France is a country that has been inspired by republicanism. And, um, and it's traditionally defined as a universalist country and a colorblind nation. Uh, there is this idea that um, French identity requires an individual to transcend their culture, to transcend their religion, to achieve liberty. And those theories has been, uh, have been crest crystallized during uh, the Enlightenment. And, uh, and uh, we have this concept that to achieve individual autonomy, we have to be free from religion. So the first, um, if you want, the, the first, uh, the, the ancestor of laicity, the, the first path to laicity uh, were, in the, uh, were uh, implemented at school first. Uh, in the 19th century, where again, we had this idea that school is kind of the sacred place where we are going to train kids to become citizens. And for that, uh, we needed the Catholic Church to get out of schools. It, did, it was not, and I mean, of course, there was some, uh, there was a lot of anti-Catholicism uh, hatred at that time, but the idea was not to go after Catholicism, but just to remove its influence from school. So school play a key role into this. I'm not going to get into the historical details because there are so many things to say, but fast forward to 1905, a very important piece of legislation was adopted in December 1905, the law on separation uh, of uh, church and state, knowing that in France, uh, we use the plural for church. So it's churches and state, and it's very important. Uh, that law uh, implies a couple of things. Uh, first, this idea, again, that we need uh, to ensure that the church religion does not interfere with state affair and vice versa. So we implement religious neutrality for the state and its civil servants because civil servants are the state. They represent the state, right? However, we are going to protect in exchange religious freedom uh, for individuals and freedom of conscience, which was a novelty at that time. So the freedom to believe, the freedom to not believe, the freedom to change religion. There is a limitation, however, uh, the limitation being uh, public order, public order disturbance. I'm going, uh, since I think there are a lot of Americans, I believe some people will disagree with me that in the world, there are two countries that are actually like France and the United States. In the US with the first amendment, you are going, uh, the idea is really to protect the people against the excess of the state, against the potential abuses of the state in matter of religious freedom and freedom of conscience. So it's really from the bottom to the top. And that's how religious freedom and separation of church and state is perceived. In France, it's the other way around. It's a system that go from the top to the bottom, as in we are going to protect the state against the excess of religion, against the potential abuses of uh, religion. And we have always been suspicious towards religion. And this law in plus of protecting religious freedom and freedom of conscience implies that the state does not recognize any religion. And finally, that the state does not found religion. Those are principles, but of course, there are many exceptions. I'm not going to get into the technical details. So that's pretty simple. You basically do what you want as long as you don't, you know, uh, disturb public order and the state remain neutral. And uh, since I see the mistakes so many times on social media, especially and in certain types of media, the public square is not neutral. The state is. So you can wear any religious signs, again, uh, as long as you don't disturb public order, which is another issue, 
uh, you can basically practice, practice your faith. But what happened is uh, with the evolution of the demographics of France, especially after uh, decolonization, and uh, when we had uh, the first immigrants who came uh, uh, after the 60s, around the 70s uh, for labor purposes, the demographics of France changed. And uh, there was these issues, France was struggling with its own identity by seeing its demographic changing, especially uh, with the arrival of population from its, uh, former, um, its former colonies. And uh, fast forward to the 90s uh, in an international context that was marked by, um, by the beginning of wars, especially in certain regions of uh, the, the Middle East and North Africa, we had the first a debate around laicite, and especially with the first headscarf affair in Cray in 1989, where uh, female students were kicked out, I mean, were expelled of schools because they were wearing a headscarf. And it was uh, very interesting because the Council of State, upon the request of the government, released an opinion on the topic, and it was a pretty liberal uh, decision, a pretty liberal opinion. The Council of State said that basically, as long as those kids do not disturb public order, they benefit from religious freedom and they don't have neutrality. The state, civil servant teachers are neutral. Uh, however, it didn't stop there. A first law uh, prohibiting conspicuous religious signs was adopted in 2004. And uh, of course, targeting the wearing of the headscarf when you look at the intention of the legislator. And this had opened a, a Pandora box ever since we haven't stopped implementing, adopting legislation targeting Muslims and especially Muslim women's garments on the ground of violating laicity. That's what I call the weaponization of laicity uh, from a tool that was pretty liberal, uh, which implied like obligation upon the state. We have seen an extension of neutrality imposed on the people and targeting a certain part of the population we deem unacceptable. So laicity became a tool for political identity. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, Marwan, um, uh, Dr. Gabon had mentioned this about Gerard Damanin, who's, you know, kind of uh, works alongside Macron to institute policies. Um, and he's been in charge of shutting down mosques and Muslim organizations. Um, and they've done this by labeling, labeling them as places promoting radicalization or supporting Islamism. You were the head of CCIF, France's leading anti-Islamophobia organization. And in 2020, the French government shut it down with Minister Darmanin calling the organization, quote, an enemy of the Republic. What impact has this had on Muslim civil society and for those organizations in the country that are tracking or monitoring anti-Muslim racism? Yes, thank you for uh, thank you for the question. I was the director of the Collective Against Islamophobia up until 2017. It's um, an organization, maybe the leading organization uh, in terms of like addressing hate crime cases and discrimination cases. And in every single poll we conducted with Muslims, it used to be like the leading organization they support, uh, the one that gets the most. Uh, grassroots traction, the most subscribers, the most like uh, uh, monthly donors, and it would handle uh, year to year like 3,000 calls, 800 cases uh, uh, with a successful uh, resolution rate of 92 to 95 percent. To give you like the operational uh, uh, side of uh, of the of the matter. So in 2020, when there was the horrible, horrendous killing of a teacher who used. Uh, caricatures in his uh, in his classrooms. Basically, uh, Gérald Darmanin already had uh, um, CCIF as a, as a target. Why? Because they would claim uh, that there is Islamophobia in uh, in uh, in France. To which the organization would respond: "We promise, we'll stop saying it when you stop doing it." So basically, you don't shoot the ambulance, you don't criticize the ambulance for just like uh, uh, raising awareness on the fact that there is a health issue, or in this case, a discrimination uh, issue, a racial uh, issue. So start, first he accused CCIF of being involved 
uh, in the killing of the teacher. Then the investigation showed that there was no such thing, there was no link whatsoever. In the opposite, even uh, CCIF like tried to convince the, the, the one of the father uh, uh, involved in the case to take down the video exposing the teacher for showing the for showing the caricature. Then he claimed that basically CCIF has links. Uh, whatsoever we like terrorist groups or anti-governmental groups and the investigation showed that it was flawed also he was even quoting names of people who do not exist with links with ccif that did not exist and when it reached like the serious level uh, or the state council level basically they eventually ruled that claiming that there is islamophobia in france in and of itself constitutes an incitement to hatred against France by making France a target for international criticism and potentially for terrorist groups. So the fact that you claim that racism in France is an issue, that there is state-sponsored Islamophobia, that 60% of the discrimination cases occur in public services, that the government has done nothing to change, to curb this discrimination and this uh, form of racism against Muslims, in and of itself justifies the dissolution of the uh, organization. And this is so loose and this is so uh, uh, new in terms of like breaking the rule of law that this created a precedent and it has been used since then to criminalize and dissolve any political dissent in terms of human rights organization. It happened to another anti-Islamophobia organization, the Coordination contre le Racisme and uh, l'Islamophobie. It happened to uh, uh, organizations supporting human rights for Palestinian uh, communities. And it happened also uh, to a left-wing media uh, called Nantes Révolté. The government asked for the dissolution of this organization, claiming that because they criticized the police, then basically they put every cop in danger in, uh, in France. And for criticizing the government, they create a danger. They are against the Republic. So this is how they would, uh, they would, uh, they would do with human rights organization. And the impact uh, for Muslim communities was devastating because CCIF basically was the Muslim's lawyer in, in terms of like using the laws to protect human rights and fundamental freedoms for anyone affected by actual hate crimes or discrimination cases. So if you say you cannot access your rights, you cannot use the law to protect your fundamental freedoms, what does it mean for Muslims? It means you don't belong. It means you are a second class citizen. It means you are not worthy like any other citizen to exert your rights and ask for justice. It means, look what we can do with the strongest Islamic organization or with the strongest organization working with Muslims. Imagine what we will do to you individually. Imagine what we will do to your mosque, to your Islamic organization. And if I want to end uh, with a comparison with the US, because I want to make it palatable for you, uh, for you guys. The concept of universalism, uh, uh, Rim Sara was uh, referring to, uh, has been weaponized in the way that it's, it's been used as a way to shut down any form of uh, concern communities would express. So imagine that uh, uh, people in the Black Lives Matters movement would claim that, okay, uh, police uh, are harming black men at an alarming rate. Some of them are killed, and this is becoming a structural issue, and this has been for a long time. And then you have your all life matters claiming, hey, you guys, are, you, you are breaking down the, the American uh, multicultural society just by saying that black life matters, like if other lives uh, don't matter. Then imagine that the government uh, is going to crack down on every community center, every church, every mosque attended by black people or Arab people or Asian people or any minority in the area and saying, hey, if you criticize the state for doing so, then we will shut you down. We will choose for you who will be your leaders. We will select who are the good and the bad among you guys. We will choose who is acceptable and is a decent, normal citizen and who is an enemy of the state. So you see how this contradicts the very principle of separation between the state and the churches. Basically, laicite in, 2000, uh, in uh, 2022 means everyone is neutral except for Muslims because we are going to tell you who you should pray behind, how you should practice your religion, what is an acceptable mosque. And so, and I will end on this, uh, on, this, uh, on this note, if the rule of law 
uh, is not sufficient, if breaking the rule of law is not sufficient to assert political and ideological control over Muslim, they implement uh, a strategy that they called uh, entravement in French, which is entrapment uh, in English. They will uh, use um, administrative powers and health inspection, security inspection, architectural inspection, fire extinguisher inspections to find any motive to close down a mosque. So if they don't see, if the imam said nothing wrong, uh, we will move to the next stage. If the director or president of the association did nothing wrong, we will move to the next stage. If they miss a file, uh, uh, um, a report, a financial report, we will move to the next stage. If we cannot find a way to close down the mosque for security issues, we will close it down for health issues. We will close it down for financial issues. We will close it down with any motive we find. And even uh, when basically mosques take this to court and win, it's not enough. We move to the next stage at the state council level. Anything we can use to criminalize these guys until we assert political and ideological power over them. So that's the, the extent to which the current French government is willing to go just to control Muslims. Um, Dr. Gabon, after you know hearing everything that Marwan has just described about targeting a Muslim civil society, um, how is France's rightward shift impacting broader Europe? How are France's policies impacting how other European states are uh, treating their Muslim citizens? Uh, how is it impacting Europe? That, that's hard to, uh, to answer that. One would have to look at the situations in each uh, and every of those states. Uh, but there are two ways in which it could impact negatively, uh, and not, not just Muslims, again, I, I, I insist on that, the, the logic that Marwan has described very well in relation to Muslims is being applied to everybody now, uh, including non-Muslims, and that's the, the point of the anti-separatism bill, uh, which says that uh, regardless of whether you're Muslim, non-Muslim, and you have to look precisely at how Macron has formulated his definition of separatism, which is an, a new word, a, a concept, a word that did not exist before in political language. It existed in sociology, but not in political language. Uh, and he defines separatism as um, an attempt, a will, uh, 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 a temptation to, uh, and I quote uh, out of memory, to separate yourself from the Republic and from the uh, frameworks of the Republic, it's not just the laws. He's not just talking about breaking laws, but uh, trying to depart uh, even a little bit uh, through little gestures, small words, ces petits rien, ces petits gestes, as, as he said in his discourse, from the frameworks, rules, norms, and principles of the Republic. And if you try to separate yourself, to depart from the Republic, uh, and again, that applies to everybody, not just Muslims, then you are a separatist. Uh, and uh, separatism is now uh, not a crime in legal term, but it's a legal infraction. So you're not even allowed to separate yourself politically, symbolically, from the Republic. Of course, this, this criteria applies only to Muslims, uh, even though theoretically and potentially it can be applied to anyone else uh, who uh, criticizes or departs from the frameworks of the Republic and, and becomes a dissident. Uh, they are, but they are not applying it, for example, to uh, royalist Catholics you know, who want to restore the monarchy, or they are not applying separatism to uh, uh, to uh, the Corsicans who are fighting for actual separation from the state. They're, they're going to apply it to Muslims first. But uh, to go back to the question of uh, how it can impact uh, the rest of Europe, uh, if you look at, for example, the laws against the hijab and the burqa, very often it's been used as a model, uh, as a ready-made uh, kind of law. Uh, 
imitated, emulated uh, by other countries, uh, Belgium, Switzerland, uh, and, and not just in Europe, like Canada has done that, you know, Canada or like a couple of years after the March 15, 2004 laws uh, that uh, Rim was talking about, which remains a seminal moment, right? It's an absolutely fundamental moment in the transformation of laicite into a, a, into a, a weapon against Muslims. Uh, first of all, but not just against Muslims. Uh, so those laws are very often uh, scrutinized, uh, imitated, emulated by other European countries. Uh, they offer a ready-made toolkit, as I call it, that any Islamophobic government can readily borrow and apply at home. Uh, and it's not just theoretical. Uh, several governments have actually done that with uh, the, the, the law against uh, Islamic outfits of uh, 2004, with the law against the burqa of 2011, uh, and they could do it uh, exactly the same way with the anti-separatism bill. And so once those projects are here, uh, they can be borrowed uh, uh, and applied at home by any government who want to do that. And they would even have the alibi of saying, well, look, France, the inventor of human rights, you know, the, the creators of freedom, they're doing that. So why would we, why wouldn't we, Hungary, Switzerland, England, Germany, and so on, do that? And several countries have imitated those laws in the past. Um, uh, the other way, that, yes. Sorry, that leads me, I, I'd like Reem Sarah to have, uh, I want to ask her one question before we open it up to Q&A, because um, we are at the 45 minute mark. Um, you were talking about the, the targeting of the hijab and how other countries in Europe could are, are mimicking that or using that as kind of justifying their own hijab bans. Reem Sarah, um, how have, you know, French government policies um, against the hijab impacted the lives of French Muslim women? How, how is it for, for them living in France right now? I think you're on mute, sorry. Sorry, it happens all the time. Um, no, it, it's very interesting because, uh, you know, um, the way uh, public authorities, the government, and by the way, it goes way before uh, Macron's administration, right? I think uh, the, 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 the biggest, uh, I mean, it started with Jacques Chirac with the law of 2004 and so on, but really with Nicolas Sarkozy, when it was really blatant, open bar anti-Muslim bigotry, if I may say. Uh, but uh, the more Muslims are enough confident in their Frenchness, the more they believe in the institutions and the values of this country. The more they are visible because there are enough French to be visible because they live in this country, which is theirs. They don't know any other country. The more they are, and I absolutely hate that expression, but for the sake of our discussion, I will use it. They are quote unquote integrated. The more it becomes a problem. Uh, so, for example, uh, the case of the Burkini is actually quite telling. Uh, you have a bunch of women who decide to go, you know, on the beach, covering their body for whatever reasons, religious or whatsoever, and we are going to penalize them, to blame them for being visible and for doing things that all French people are doing. So it's, we are going to free you but by banning you from public visibility. So you stay at home and you, a good Muslim is an invisible Muslim. A good Muslim is uh, an, a Muslim that abide by the rules that were imposed to them because according to uh, certain views on Islam and Muslims by the state, a Muslim cannot be free. A Muslim is an inherently violent and a potential trait threat to the nation. So what happened is uh, we have a, a group of individual and especially women who are trying their best, who are educated here, who know their rights, who cannot live their lives, mm -hmm. who cannot live their lives. And what happened is many of them who have the privilege to do so leave the country. They are going in other countries in the EU, they're going to Germany. They are going uh, to Italy. They are going outside of the EU, Canada, France. So 
if I want to talk in economic terms, uh, and I'm not a statistician, obviously, so I speak under uh, everybody's control here, uh, we have a brain drain. Like we have our talents who are living in this country because we deem them undesirable. And at some point, really, the, the bigger uh, count, uh, the bigger debate is it, what does it mean to be French today, and why France feels threatened by a piece of clothes, really. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I always give that example. Uh, I, I gave it in interviews, but I will give it here again. You know, when a Muslim woman clean your office, when a Muslim woman, you know, take care of your elder, your parents, your grandparents, it's a good Muslim. She is quiet, she or he, but mostly she is quiet. She won't say anything. She won't uh, question the authority, even though, uh, you know, uh, she is suffering, you know, of racist abuses. But as soon as a Muslim woman born and raised here who know her rights, who know this country, uh, become educated, raise her voice, question the state, question the people she elected, automatically she becomes a threat. So uh, again, what kind of society do we want today? We, we are a great country. We have great values, liberty, equality, fraternity, our constitutional principles, but we are not abiding by them. And I think that's the saddest part is that we have people who are you know, part of the fabric of this country, who contributed to the construction of this country, to the survival of this country. And yet in 2022, we are still doing that. It's draining. And Muslims, and I will uh, conclude by that. Muslims are not asking to be recognized as minorities. Muslims just want to be left alone and to live their lives and to be treated equally. They want laicity to be applied to them the way the law of 1905 was supposed to be applied to everyone. They want equality. Equality, the core principle of this nation, of this country. Thank you. Marwan, I'm going to let you quickly respond because you wanted to talk about the international impacts um, of the current situation in France and how that's impacting things in Europe and internationally. So I'm going to quickly let you respond to that and then I will get to q and A's. I'm very sorry, everyone. It's uh, totally fine. Sure. So basically, France is uh, seen as a model, a matrix, where you can construct racism uh, without the guilt. So imagine that you could do uh, whatever you want to any minority especially Muslims, and then you can get away with it, claiming that you are uh, uh, freeing them, that you are helping them, that you are trying to fight uh, separatism. And this is why uh, there has been kind of a contamination effect on the laïcité debate, on the neutrality debate in any French-speaking country, (coughs) neutrality in Belgium, uh, Bill 21 uh, with the Canadian Quebecian uh, values uh, in uh, in uh, in Quebec, and then the security part of the agenda has been taken on. For instance, the Prevent program in uh, in the UK has been very much uh, built in com- in competition or in comparison with the French system. And one specific country is Austria because it's the first true ally of France at the European level. And now they are working in conjunction at the European level to promote their matrix, uh, their frame of thought to criminalize any political participation, any civil participation of Muslims in the public sphere. And this is why uh, uh, the the two countries has been sharing even documents in promoting them at the European level to push, to lobby for this to be the new framework for dealing with Muslims and Islam and so-called Islamism. India is looking at this, China is looking at this, and if you look closer at the, uh, at the language used, at the legal provisions used, whether it be in China or in India, to criminalize and demonize Muslims, you see that they looked at the French playbook and used whatever they could apply to their local context. So it's not a French conversation, it's a French source of demonization and criminalization of Muslims, and it becomes over time kind of a toolbox for criminalizing minorities and getting away with it. That's mm-hmm. the bigger, more global issue. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, I think we probably have time for one question. This has been such a great conversation. I wish we had more time. Um, it's not directed at anyone. Um, so whoever would like to respond, um, uh, one of our uh, audience members asked, are there contestants in this election who go against this trend of Islamophobia and of securitizing Islam and Muslims? And if yes, how are they received? 
Um, can I bring some response? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. It's quite interesting. It, it's a very good question uh, because uh, across the political spectrum, anti-Muslim hatred has become such a great tool of distraction, such a great tool to basically attract a certain part of the electorate that is needed to access power that unfortunately very few candidates, a couple of exceptions, are actually even talking about it worse. Uh, of course, we have the far right, which is rising and shining. Uh, the right wing has become a more bourgeois version of the far right. So same narrative. So at some point I expect an alliance. I think somehow in certain areas it has already happened, but it's also the left. We, we tend to forget about it, but the left has been, uh, there was a rightization of the left, uh, which, has been using the tools of the right wing and the far right, uh, and I'm thinking about François Hollande's administration and, uh, and uh, his uh, former prime minister, Manuel Valls, uh, where we have been uh, noticing a, a direct attack on, on Muslims, uh, asking them to be discreet, you know, condoning uh, Burkini bans and so on. Uh, and of course, many examples, but we don't have time. But a part of the left uh, had became quote unquote, hardliner secularists, pushed by a vision of laicite, which is basically now laicite became public order. It, 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 it was transformed into another element of public order, even though it was supposed to be a component of freedom and equality. And so, uh, you know, it has been a long time since the left wing and especially the socialist party uh, has dropped the fight against racism, against discrimination, and the very few parties who are trying to navigate around the topic do it in a way that serves their own interest. And Rana, it is not in the interest of the people of power to fight for human rights and freedom because, you know, first they go after Muslims and, you know, the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gabon, please go ahead. Can I add something? Yes. Um... Uh, yes, I agree with everything that <laughs> Rin Sarah has said. Uh, uh, very often the left has been uh, responsible for spreading Islamophobia, very often uh, more than the right. Uh, uh, if we think about characters like uh, Manuel Valls, for example, who's been at the forefront of the uh, perversion, violation, transformation of laicity and targeting of Muslims. However, if you examine, uh, and, and I want to disagree a little bit with Rin Sarah uh, to end uh, possibly on a positive note. Uh, if you look at the programs of the left, socialists, communists, and uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, La France Insoumise, it, there is a significant difference with what the uh, uh, conservative right and the far right is offering. I mean, uh, uh, everything from the far right of Zemmour, Le Pen, uh, Dupont-Aignan, including uh, the centrist uh, right of Macron, it's very clear if you look at their programs, at their proposals, it's a competition between the bad and the worse. <laughs> uh, it's different on the left if you look at the programs of the socialists, the communists, and La France Insoumise. Just one example uh, that surprised me when I examined the program, uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon wants to abolish the anti-separatism bill. Entirely, he wants to, uh, uh, to, to, to eliminate it. Uh, and uh, he has like five extremely violent pages against that bill uh, that echo most of what we've said here, even though it comes from a different perspective, more of an anti-clerical perspective. Uh, it's yeah. right over his proposals. However, he said that it's uh, uh, an Islamophobic bill, uh, that it's a, a hypocritical project uh, on the part of Islamophobes who are violating laicite in order to stigmatize our Muslim compatriots, and if he's elected, uh, he will eliminate that bill. And in the current climate, that's very brave to do that. <laughs> but uh, and, and uh, he's the main party of the left. So he, he's at twenty percent, and he's possibly the 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 he's going possibly going to be the, the the second contestant in the, the the forthcoming election. So there is a at least in the programs in the proposals. Uh, a substantial difference between uh, the parties of the left and the parties of the center right, all the way to the far right of Zemmour. 
And I'm going to ask one last question to each one of you very briefly. What are your predictions for what is going to happen starting April 10th? If you can sum it up for me very quickly. Uh, Marwan, I'll start with you. More of the same. Uh, whoever is elected, whether it be uh, Emmanuel Macron or Marine Le Pen, uh, they are going to get involved uh, in the same type of practices. The criminalization of uh, mosques and uh, civil society is an ongoing thing, and it came down at the institutional level. It's not only a government thing now, it, it, it disseminated into the local prefects, police constables, uh, and local institutions. So this will take five, ten years minimum uh, to reverse and uh, and mitigate, even if someone like Jean-Luc Mélenchon is uh, is elected, and then even in this third scenario where he would be elected, he will still have to, between brackets, prove himself to the center right and to the rest of the population. So, although I agree, of course, with the, with Dr. Gabon, that this is a huge political signal for him to say that uh, I recognize Islamophobia. I'm going to dismantle the separatism uh, bill if I'm uh, if I'm elected. When it comes to uh, gaining power and asserting power in the position of government, uh, I'd like to remind us all that back in 2017, there was a candidate who was like trying to address Islamophobia and getting rid of the topic, uh, toxic debates against, uh, around laicite, and his name was Emmanuel Macron. Yeah. <laughs> Reem Sarah, I'm going to hand it over to you real quickly. What are your predictions? Two things. Uh, the far right has already won. If not in power, it's in the discourse, it's in the institutions. So we basically just are waiting for the candidates to win, whoever that is. And second, the big winner of them all, abstention. Uh, there is a life in Paris, the sixth first arrondissement, and there is a life outside of Paris that we forget about. And there is a life in overseas territories that we are completely ignoring most of the time. Uh, and I think it speaks volume about the state of our democracy and we have to do some sort of change. Dr. Gavon? Yes, uh, at the risk of making a fool of myself, but that wouldn't be the first time, I'm pretty confident that Macron is going to get reelected, unfortunately. Uh, and now that he has all those new uh, instruments and legal tools, anti separatism bills and so on, uh, that he voted, uh, that he passed in 2021, he's going to be able to deploy them even more, especially since. Uh, he won't be able to run a third time uh, for the uh, for the next election, so he's going to be absolutely comfortable with doing everything he wants. Uh, to me, the uncertainty is who's going to be uh, uh, against him for the second round. If it's going to be Marine Le Pen or Jean-Luc Mélenchon, possibly Valérie Pécresse, uh, so that's mm -hmm. pretty much the only uncertainty. Uh, but we'll see on Sunday. I, I, I say it's going to be it's going to be Marine Le Pen uh, versus uh, uh, Macron, and we're going to have a more or less a repeat of uh, the 2017 elections, except that, as Rin Sarah said, Macron has moved to the far right so much that it's a difference of degree. It's really more of a, than a difference of, uh, of substance. Thank you all so much for this wonderful conversation. Um, thank you everyone who joined us. I know I wish we had more time. Um, there's so much more to talk about. Please do follow each of our panelists, follow them on their social media, follow their works. They're, I'm sure they'll be commenting as the election uh, starts. Um, and I know we'll all be watching You know, as everyone heads to the polls um, for this very, very important election. Be sure to follow Bridge on all of our social media platforms, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Merci. Bye, everybody. Merci beaucoup. Take care, y'all. Bye now. <laughs>